Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Hi, Dan and Sherry. Thanks for participating in this. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Wolfden's proposal and uh, tell you um, uh, some of the reasons we're so worried about it. Um, first and foremost, this is a proposal to put a mine in just about as bad a place as you could imagine putting a mine. Um, this is a picture of Pleasant Lake, um, which is right next to the mine site. And this is a state um, heritage fish water, which means it's an outstanding brook trout fishery. Uh, and two things brook trout don't like are heavy metal pollution and acid pollution, both of which are risks from the type of mine that Wolfden is proposing. Uh, next slide. So you can see uh, sort of towards the upper right, a little green square that says Pickett Mountain Mine. That's where Wolfden is proposing to put this mine. Um, it's not very far from the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, and it's not very far from Baxter State Park. It's right in the headwaters of the West Branch Mattawamkeag River. Uh, and all of it is in critical habitat for Atlant endangered Atlantic salmon. So it's just not, not a good place uh, for a mine. Of, of, and, um, you know, it's, it's a real threat to the traditional uh, outdoor economy in this region and to Maine's, really to Maine's brand. Next slide. This is just to give you a little bit more of a close up of where uh, the mine would go. Um, you can see a pond above that red um, outlined area. That's um, Pleasant Lake, which again is a state heritage brook trout water. To the right of that, you can see Mud Lake, another state heritage brook trout water. And um, then there's another smaller pond below Mud Lake called Grass Pond which is also state heritage brook trout water. These types of waters are special because, not only because the, the fishing in them is really good, but because they haven't been stocked in a very long period of time. And in fact, grass pond hasn't been stocked at all. So these are um, wild fisheries and um, really high value. And relatively speaking for Maine, they're easy to access. So these are these are really important resources, uh, both ecologically and um, in terms of recreational fishing and guiding. Next slide. This is a picture of Pickett Mountain and Pickett Mountain Pond. Um, this is a beautiful area. Um, I would encourage all of you to visit this area. It's really spectacular. It's a great place to go fishing and bird hunting and hiking. Next slide. And this is a picture of Pleasant Lake. And you can see that this is right near Mount Chase, which is a nice hike and not that far from Mount Katahdin. Um, Pickett Mountain is off, uh, off the photo in this one, but um, you can see from the arrow about where that would be. Uh, next slide. So, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, where this whole process is right now and conclude with, with um, a little advice about how we hope you can help us fight this proposal. Um, this is a beautiful photo, by the way, from uh, uh, a beautiful photo from the summit of Mount Chase. Um, it's a really nice place to go hiking. Um, those are upper and lower Shin Pond in the background. Also very no well-known um, recreational water bodies in Maine. Um, Wolfden has done this once before. Uh, in 2017, they bought this property and they came before uh, the Land Use Planning Commission asking to rezone this land for mining um, in 2020. Their application was a disaster. Um, 
the Land Use Planning Commission staff met with them countless times, tried to get them to clean up the application to make it um, comprehensible. And they did not succeed in doing that. And um, in a very unusual uh, move, LUPC staff asked the commission to reject the rezoning petition without even holding a hearing. And this is the first time that I've ever heard of something like that happen. Um, Wolf Den can't mine unless it gets this rezoning passed because the land it owns is only zoned for very small scale development like camps or for forestry. And if they do get a rezoning from the Land Use Planning Commission, and we certainly hope that they won't and will work to see that they won't, um, they still have to get a permit from the Department of Environmental Protection, which is a much more difficult and detailed process than the rezoning. But quite frankly, we don't want it to get that far. Um, this company has a very poor track record. They've never developed a mine. They've never even sold a property to someone else to develop a mine. They have um, lost about $41 million since the company was formed uh, 15 or so years ago. They lost $400,000 in the first quarter of um, uh, this year. Um, they have very few staff, maybe five or six people, and yet they've told the Land Use Planning Commission that they are gonna be the cleanest mine in the world. They've said they're gonna use uh, what's called reverse osmosis technology, and they'll be able to discharge wastewater at levels that are cleaner than the natural surface water and the natural groundwater in the area that they're in right now. And there is no mining company on planet Earth that we know of that can do that. No hard rock mining company of this type. Um, you know, even really well-resourced companies with a lot of technical experience um, can't do that. And that's why Wolfden has not, still not, provided an example of a company anywhere that can do what they say they're going to do. And they've made this same claim again in their second application. The major change from the first time around is that um, they have decided to say that <clears throat> the processing facility for their ore will not go in the unorganized territories and therefore the Land Use Planning Commission shouldn't worry about it. Um, don't consider it as part of this rezoning petition. That's for DEP to worry about later on. And that's really um, just a smoke and mirrors game. It's it's saying, don't look behind the curtain. Um, that processing facility will still have to go in very close to um, where they would have the mine. It's gonna have impacts on this region. And um, the processing facility is um, probably the most dangerous part of a mining operation, but um, the, the mining operation itself is a source of acid contamination and metal contamination um, and either way, this is a bad proposal um, that will harm really valuable resources and uh, a, a really treasured region of the state of Maine. So I would urge everyone, um, we, we still don't know when the hearing on this is going to be, but we have pushed for there to be a hearing in a central location like Bangor so that all of the um, at, at least a public uh, listening session in a central location like Bangor, so that all of the process doesn't happen, um, you know, w way up close near Patton. It's likely that the technical part of the hearings, which happen during the day, will be up in that region. But we feel very strongly that this is a statewide issue, and there should be somewhere accessible um, for Maine people from all over the state to be able to get to a public uh, comment period and um, make their feelings uh, about this mine known. And as soon as we know the date and the location of where that listening session or multiple listening sessions will be, 
um, we will let you all know. And with that, I think I'm gonna close and I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Kuzniers um, from the Penobscot Indian Nation. Take it away, Dan. Thank you, Nick. So um, thank you all for uh, for joining us to to learn more about this project and, and what you can do to, uh, to help stop it. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Penobscot Indian Nation and you know, our perspectives on the, the Wolfton uh, mining project that's being proposed. Next slide. So to give you a little bit of background, um, this is just a map, oh, shot ahead. Um, to give you some perspective on where Penobscot uh, Nation lands are. So the tribe has kind of three types of lands with reservation, which is the Penobscot River which starts in Old Town and um, and continues on upstream. And so that's, you know, very important uh, sacred uh, waters um, that provide the life ways to the Penobscot people and have since time immemorial. And we also, uh, the tribe also has trust lands that are scattered around the state. And in particular, we have some trust lands that are located in close, close proximity to where the proposed mine is and that we're concerned would be affected by it. Um, the tribe also has some, some fee lands are, and are also in the process of trying to acquire additional land, some of which um, may be affected by the proposed mine. Next slide. So uh, the proposed mine site is located you know, very close proximity to and threatens several tracts of very significant conservation land. So uh, it's about 15 miles from Penobscot Nations, what we refer to as our Matagammon Trust Land. So this is in T6R8 wells. It also, uh, and contained within that is Great Lake Matagammon and Mountain Catcher Pond, which are both very important waters to the Penobscot Nation. It's also in very close proximity to uh, Baxter State Park and the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. You know, as Nick said, you, you really would have a hard time finding a worse place to uh, to put a mine. And one of the big concerns we have is it threatens both the Mattawamkeag River, or the west branch of the Mattawamkeag, which ultimately goes into the Mattawamkeag, and then ultimately into the Penobscot River. And depending upon where the... Um, the ore processing facility and some of the other things that have been carved out from the previous petition, would, that potentially those waters are, or that wastewater could end up going into the east branch of the Penobscot River, which the tribe would uh, you know, have very con big concerns about. Next slide. So the west branch of the Mattawamkeg, just to give you a little background and kind of the water quality, it's uh, the whole area is water quality uh, class A, which is the second highest classification uh, for main waters. Uh, it's designated as critical habitat for endangered species, um, Atlantic sea run Atlantic salmon. It's uh, the west branch of the Mattawamkeg is a really important for the success of the Penobscot River Restoration Project for Atlantic salmon and other sea run and adramus fish species. As Nick said, it's also state heritage, wild brook trout habitat waters in that area. And it, it uh, these areas do not contain, you know, a bunch of non-native um, exotic species. And much, I could basically say the same thing about uh, the East Branch of the Penobscot, uh, except that is class AA waters. And, but similarly, it's uh, really important for, uh, for sea run Atlantic salmon and uh, restoration of them and other sea run species. Next slide. Uh, just three weeks or so, we, we were up uh, in the area looking at the proposed uh, mine site. And uh, these are a couple of pictures of, uh, this is Pleasant Lake, which Nick showed some pictures of before, just a really beautiful place and really, you know, very quiet, Lots of uh, critter tracks all around the area. 
Um, and just, um, you know, we didn't get to fish it, but it uh, looks like it would be a great place for, for fishing. Um, and then also the, the slide uh, to, or the picture to the right is uh, grassy, um, just real beautiful classic brook trout water. Next slide. So uh, I referenced the uh, Penobscot River Restoration Project. This is a, a project that the Penobscot Nation was one of the key partners in, and it really was a huge success. So that involved removing the, in the Milford area, removing the, um, the Great Works Dam and the VZ Dam, and then also um, building a bypass channel on the west, on the Piscataquis River in the town of Howland. And so there's a lot of people, a lot of money that has been spent to restore these anadromous fish species back to some of their historic areas. And uh, this project has been a huge success in doing so. Next slide. This just shows you uh, kind of a before and after with the habitat that um, for a lot of these uh, fish species, including uh, salmon and uh, eels and other species. And it shows you um, how, you know, prior to those dams being removed, little or no, little or no um, tribal sustenance fishing of those species was was occurring up and above above those dams because the fish couldn't access that. And then on the right, you can see all the habitat that uh, that was opened up from the removal of those dams. And there's a bunch of work that since happened uh, in the Penobscot watershed since those dams have been removed, including putting in a lot of natural fishways, removing lots of barriers, and just connectivity for fish to be able to get into their uh, historic habitats. And so this uh, this project really puts a significant threat on all this hard work and money that's been spent to restore these important species. Next slide. This is just a few photo photos to show you some of the Atlantic salmon restoration efforts that are going on or have been going on. Uh, we've been working with collaborative stocking of Atlantic salmon fry with uh, federal and state agencies in the East Branch of the Penobscot and Mattawamkeag Rivers. Uh, there's a, a recent project that Maine DMR has been leading to raise and, and then release adult Atlantic salmon to the East Branch of the Penobscot River. Uh, we've been involved with some water quality and benthic uh, productivity studies looking at the East Branch before and after these fish are, are released. Um, NOAA just recently funded I can't remember the exact amount, but I think it's around three, three and a half million dollars to the Penobscot Nation for doing flow studies and habitat restoration on the east branch of the Penobscot River. So you can see there's just, you know, a tremendous amount of work that's going into protecting these waters. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about... Um, Matag about the Matagamon or T6R8 area. So this is a photograph of um, Grand Lake Matagamon looking south uh, on the on the right. In the background, you can see Horse Mountain. And so um, that's at where um, contained within Baxter State Park. And this is just an incredibly important um, place for the Penobscot Nation. You know, it's historically been used by the tribe for, for thousands of years. And um, next slide. So this area is one of the, the only cold water, uh, deep cold water lakes that the tribe has on its land. So it's really important for landlocked salmon and brook trout, um, both during the summertime and the wintertime. Lots of tribal members go up there to, to uh, catch fish. It's an important area for harvesting moose and deer for sustenance. Uh, lots of bald eagles and other important wildlife species there that are, you know, culturally significant for the tribe. Next. And the tribe uses these, these lands such as um, the, in the area of Matagamon for carrying out, you know, its cultural activities for gathering materials such as birch bark and spruce and balsam. Um, 
for for making traditional birch bark canoes um, and for collecting materials to use for uh, uh, basket making, for gathering wild and other wild foods. Next slide. So these are just some photos of, you know, historical use and current use by the tribe. So gathering, you know, mushrooms, uh, fiddlehead ferns, uh, medicinal plants. And so if this proposed mine happens, it, it, uh, it threatens these uses. Next. And these are just uh, some, some pictures of uh, the Matagamon area and the East Branch of the Penobscot River. And uh, the last, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, I've personally visited some some really bad mining sites uh, in Indian country or affecting Indian country or around in other parts of the of North America. So this here is a site at Bunker Hill, uh, Idaho, that just devastated the area. So it destroyed over 166 river miles, uh, all kinds of waste pile, waste rock, soil sediment, groundwater, surface water contaminated with all kinds of heavy metals. Um, the contaminants have are, are outside of just the river. They're up in the floodplain. They've had to re-engineer stream channels, uh, remove tailings and materials, build huge impoundments and wastewater treatment facilities after the mine was closed and uh, in order to clean up the mess that was left. So the hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent and there's still so much more that has to be done. So the, the cleanup began in 1983, and it's estimated will continue for, you know, for, for decades. And uh, the Coeur d'Alene, you know, uses of resources used by the Coeur d'Alene tribe have been destroyed. Next. This is just some photos of, of uh, the work you know, of the site and work that's had to go on to try to to repair the damages of that occurred from that. So just kind of in summary, some of the, the big concerns that the tribe has are we have you know threats to tribal members, use of natural resources for sustenance. And this isn't just recreational fishing. This is this is sustenance. This is what people rely upon you know, these fish and moose and, and wild plants uh, for their well-being and for the continuation of their culture. Uh, the threat to restoration of Atlantic salmon and other sea run fish species, the threats of water to the water quality of the Mattawamkeg, the East Branch, and then ultimately the whole Penobscot watershed, potential groundwater impacts, um, the change in the natural character of that area, you know, as Nick mentioned, this is a really wild, uh, wild area, and it's it's an important one to protect. Uh, the failure of Wolfton to recognize the important resources and to demonstrate protection of those resources. They just kind of have this black box and say, "Oh, we're just gonna, you know, we'll use, um, you know, we're gonna use processing um, that nobody else is doing anywhere else in the world." And we're supposed to uh, just, you know, trust them, which which we don't because they haven't been able to demonstrate that. There's also the failure of Wolf then to just demonstrate that they have a capacity for uh, for bringing a project like this to completion and to run it successfully. And we just, uh, you know, Penobscot Nation is very concerned about being left with a legacy of mining catastrophes like we've seen elsewhere that plague Indian country. And we just can't allow that to happen here. Next. And thank you. And with that, we're gonna pass it over to Sherry Venno. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you for doing such a great job of teeing up all the concerns and the and the impacts that we might be facing with this dam. And um, thank you NRCM for being the strong ad advocate for, for resources, natural resources in the state of Maine and, and the Penobscot Nation have always been 
um, an inspiration to the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians in their in their restoration efforts on the Penobscot River. I am I'm lucky in that I can just say yes. Um, everything that Nick and Dan told you, um, we agree with. We have the same concerns. We have the same interests, uh, um, culturally speaking, but we have a different, maybe place-based uh, interest that I'm. I want to elaborate on, and I'm going to show you a lot more maps. Um, I hope people like looking at maps, <laughs> but um, I think they will map out, as it were, our concerns and um, and how they relate to the tribe as a, as a place based community uh, with deep roots in the area and uh, issues, modern day issues that we try to, that we are trying to address. So Maliseet uh, people or the Holton Band of Maliseet are people of the Meduxnikeg River. There's a, um, there's a picture of our, our beautiful river that I took just a couple of days ago. It's actually taken um, a lot of work on, on, on uh, behalf on the part of the, the band and our partners to to get it to look like that uh, the riffles the boulders that you see in the stream those are actually um, in structures that we put it back into that stream there are many legacy impacts in the Meduxna keg um, that you'll see all over the state uh, but we are located in an area of Maine in Aroostook County where uh, habitat is incredibly fragmented. The tribe uh, settled in the Holton area once it could no longer hunt, fish, and gather um, for a living, essentially, and needed to settle down and find a place where they, where uh, a living could be made, and that was Holton, Maine. In the 1980s, uh, as part of the settlement process, we, we gained some uh, financial uh, resources, trust funds to start purchasing land. And so uh, purchased land in the Holton area, the sort of the map up on the top shows uh, the very small land base that we have. And that's one of the realities we face as a, as a, uh, a indigenous tribe that with, uh, that needs land to practice um, its culture, it's uh, to uh, un undertake its traditional practices of hunting, fishing, and gathering. So we are pretty far north. I think I should have mentioned in the earlier slide that we have a couple of um, overarching goals in our efforts to restore the Meduxna keg, and that is uh, eagles uh, on our land nesting on our land and salmon spawning in our river. Those are two big overarching goals that we, um, uh, that guide us in the activities that we take when we're working in the Meduxna keg. We are, you can, uh, you can get back to the second slide, Kristen, thank you. We are um, not uh, in the Matawam keg watershed where the mine is. We are next door. If you look at the sort of the bigger, the big watershed map, you can see that uh, uh, the Mat Matawam keg is right next door to our uh, west. In fact, we're kind of a in a little uh, nexus of watersheds. Just below us is the Scudic St. Croix, where the Passamaquoddy uh, um, territory lies, and north and east are more uh, sub basins of the larger Wallistic St. John watershed. You see, we are a a tribe uh, that is located right next to the uh, Canadian border, and our watershed is intersected by that by that political boundary. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another map um, that uh, helps explain or map out our concerns. So we are the closest community even though it is outside our watershed. We are the closest community to the proposed uh, location of the mine on Pickett Mountain. You notice that Meduxna Keg and Matawam Keg are both Wabanaki, uh, have Wabanaki origins. They're not uh, the, the initial um, names. Wabanaki people uh, gave those rivers, but they they are 
um, they, their origins come from Wabanaki languages. Meduxnikeg Medux, means rocky at its mouth, for example. And we um, have members who, we have citizens who fish in the Pickett Mountain area. I took a quick poll um, recently, just in my office, I work in the Natural Resources Department and um, our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, um, his grandfather, uh, when he was alive, spent time in the in the area hunting and fishing. Our water resources technician for the summer, our summer tech, he and his brothers and father fish in the, and, and hunt in the same area. So we can't rely on our very small land base to provide opportunity for hunting, fishing, and gathering. We we look to the surrounding area. And if you if you uh, recall the fragmented nature of of the Meduxnikeg water shed with all the potato ground up there. It's not a good place, even in the in, in the watershed itself. There's not a lot of opportunity um, like what is presented further west in the Matawamkeg. So we do spend time out there. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another, here's another look, another way to, to show that. So this I I pulled this off Google Earth. You can see. Um, the fragmented nature of uh, the area in and around and north of Holton and east of Holton. So we look to the west where there is relatively much less fragmentation and much more opportunity to um, for our tribal citizens to practice um, their culture. We also look west uh, to expand our land base. We have not been successful yet, but we are looking at land in the area so that not only can our members um, uh, practice their, their uh, traditions in the area, but they will have a base from which to do it so they don't have to travel as far as they might otherwise having to come back and forth to Holton. So it is, a, it is the area that we hope to expand to specifically to provide that opportunity to our citizens. Next slide, please. So here's another um, aspect of uh, the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. Our citizens are also part of the larger uh, Maliseet Nation or uh, Wolastigwe. We are one of the eight Wolastigwe Maliseet First Nations. This is the territory of the Willistigwe, Willistigawiuk, people of the beautiful flowing river. It's another, it's another uh, um, image of that place-based nature of Maliseet, of Wabanaki. They are riverine people, a riverine tribe. And um, while we are separated from the other seven Maliseet tribal governments, they are in Canada, New Brunswick and Quebec. We do have social and, and uh, um, cultural ties and work with them uh, to restore salmon. So we, because we have a small land base, we live very far from the coast and there is a very large dam between us and um, the Bay of Fundy. We tend to think in, in, in large scales, and I hope this next map will demonstrate that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, the, this is the Gulf of Maine watershed. There's the Penobscot watershed. There's the Willistic St. John watershed. There's the, uh, the uh, uh, St. Croix Scudic watershed of the Passamaquoddy. These are all um, important to salmon restoration. Salmon all used to in, um, swim up and, and down these rivers. They all thrived in these rivers. They all contributed to the life of the Gulf of Maine. They all contributed to the life of the North Atlantic. They all contributed to the life of the rivers uh, in these watersheds. They all contributed to the life of Wabanaki. This is this is the Dawn land. These are the watersheds of the Wabanaki. 
when we work to um, restore a river, we're working to restore its watershed. We're working to restore the watersheds uh, in the in Wabanaki territory in the Donland. We're working to restore the Gulf of Maine. We're working to restore the North Atlantic. Anything that happens in these watersheds, like a mine, like uh, removing a dam, like restoring uh, habitat, they contribute to the larger restoration of, of the entire area. Every, it's all connected. The watersheds, the Gulf of Maine, the North Atlantic, what affects salmon in the North Atlantic affects salmon in Penobscot, in the Wallistic St. John. The same, you can say the same thing in reverse. Next slide, please. We first began thinking about uh, how we might um, influence uh, this impact. So Bald Mountain is in the holistic St. John watershed. That's when we first started thinking about mining and when we first started working with NRCM to ensure that whatever mining took place, whether it was at Ball Mountain or elsewhere, was, were held to high standards. This dam that is being proposed in Pickett Mountain in the Mattawamkeg will have the same impacts as the Bald Mountain might have had, ultimately in the larger life of Wabanaki territory. So when we came out of that process, we understood that there were going to be laws that would, that would hold these um, proposals up for scrutiny and ensure that if mining happened, it would be it would happen properly. The Wolfton is trying to get away without following the rules that are established. They're trying to circumvent those rules. Uh, Nick and Dan mentioned those concerns. Next slide, please. So. Um, ourselves but others see this mine as a test of those rules. Initially, Wolfton tried to narrow the scope of LUPC's review. They didn't get away with that. They're trying again and they're trying again to circumvent the rules. They're trying to uh, separate the processing plant from the mine to somehow get through what we supported and see as really strong and important uh, protections, safeguards for Maine's environment, Wabanaki territory, salmon, Wabanaki people. So we hope that you will have the same concerns we have. I've talked a lot about Wabanaki. Um, the impacts that are on our resources are the same impacts as on uh, everyone's resources. We share these resources. They deserve to be protected. Wabanaki people deserve to be able to practice their traditions without having to be concerned about these kinds of impacts. We're already dealing with legacy impacts from for hundreds of years. This is a new one. We don't have to go down this road. We can start going in a different direction. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. I think that was a great um, transition into our what you can do and how you can be a part of this movement to protect Maine's Northwoods. Um, the first that that Nick shared is um, that you can attend and testify at the public hearing. Again, we don't have a date for that yet. We were expecting too soon. Um, but as soon as we do, we will let folks know that date and time. And um, again, how to, how to be there, how to testify. We'll make sure to share all that information. 
Um, you also can submit comments to the Land Use Planning Commission now. Um, and we will send out, we have an action alert set up that makes it really easy to do that. You can find it on our website or we'll send it around to folks in an email tomorrow. Um, we also know that we just need more people to be aware of this issue and to take action. And some great ways to spread the word are to write a letter to the editor, to your local newspaper, sharing your concerns about this project. We know decision makers often read that section of the paper um, and they're super easy to write, just 150 to 200 words. Um, and we're happy to provide guidance on how to do that if you'd like to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just to share this info and these actions with others, if we are going to defeat this proposal, we need um, as many people showing opposition as possible. Um, so share it with your family, share it with your friends, let them know about these actions and how they can get involved as well. Um, and that brings us um, to, to some questions. I already see that we have questions coming in to the Q&A box. Um, if I, my speakers wanna come back on camera, we can start to ask some of those. Um, and as if you have them coming up, feel free to pop pop the questions in and we'll get to as many as we can. And then hopefully um, if we don't get to your question, we will um, we can follow up via email. Um, but I'm going to start with this first one, which Sherry, I, I, you started to address, but I'm wondering if we can elaborate a little bit. Um, David asked, uh, within the past five to six years, Maine's mining regulations were made much more restrictive and protective of natural resources, which I think all of you are well aware since we all worked um, together to, to pass that mining law. Um, they asked what loopholes have Wolfton found? Why why can't we just let these these mining laws play out and protect um, protect us from this project? Um, you know, Kristen, I think they could probably address that question better, but I my personal opinion is um, that rules are made by people and implemented by people and uh, people can make decisions that um, aren't consistent with the rules as written. Nick, yeah, I, sure. I would say that Wolfden has not found any loopholes at this point. I think they're working on one, which is this idea of bifurcating the processing plant and uh, the, um, the uh, mine even though those two facilities are not realistically separable. You, you can't have a mine without a processing facility. You can't have a processing facility without a mine. So that's, but, but it's also important to remember that this is, um, we're still in the very early stages of this before the real um, test of, of our new mining law and rules or our 2017 mining law and rules would happen because this is just the rezoning. Um, it's not the permit itself, but it's still really important to make the case because uh, to make the case that Wolfden doesn't deserve this rezoning because A, it's a bad place to put a mine and the LUPC has responsibility to protect the unorganized territories for the whole state and B, um, if you're going to get a rezoning that allows this type of development, that type of development has to be well-planned. Wolfden um, saying that they are going to um, do something that they can't even point to another mine being able to do is not well-planned development. It's a wing and a prayer. And that's not what we how we wanna see this go forward. Thanks, Nick. Dan, anything to add to that? No, no, I think I think both uh, Sherry and Nick covered that well. I think it's just it kind of puts us in a situation of just trying to trust something that that we don't have trust in because so far the materials that they've put forth don't seem to suggest that uh, you know they're capable of of even meeting the the the, the lower bar for uh, for this you know, for the LURC, um, our LUPC uh, hurdle. Great. Yeah, I think we've said a lot that this is the wrong company to to operate a mine here. And we have a question here um, that sort of relates to that, asking what metals are Wolfden proposing to mine? And what would you say to someone who says, well, we all need these metals and 
we shouldn't say not in my backyard. Um, how would you respond to someone if that's what they were saying to you? Nick, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, they're proposing to, to mine for zinc. Um, we are not suffering from a shortage of zinc. The United States has the largest zinc mine in the world. Um, this is a very small deposit, so it would not be a significant source of zinc for our industries. And no matter where you put a mine, you're responsible for doing it right. And um, this company doesn't have the experience or the resources to do it right. And so, you know, we have to, as, as advocates and as citizens, we have to weigh the risks and benefits here. And the risks greatly outweigh the benefits given how small a deposit it is. It's not particularly high quality, whatever Wolf then says about it. Um, zinc is not in short supply. And one other thing about zinc is that we do a lousy job of recycling it. And, um, you know, we do a very good job recycling some metals like aluminum. We do a terrible job with zinc. We need to get better at it. Great. Um, we have two questions here that I'm going to combine. Um, one is, does Governor Mills have a point of view on this? And, and if so, what is it? And then similarly, are there any local legislators that we have approached and are on our side or against us? Um, is it worthwhile for people to reach out to either their legislator or to Governor Mills? Dan, you want to take a crack at that one? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, to, to my knowledge, we don't know, uh, you know, Governor Mills hasn't taken a position on this that that I'm aware of. Um, and as far as legislators, um, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Nick, do you know? I, I thought NRCM might have a better feel for, for that. So there was one legislator who was very supportive of this mine, and that was uh, Chris Johansson. He was from Mona, Monticello, I think they pronounce it. I don't know whether it's Monticello or Monticello. Monticello. Um, and he's not a legislator anymore. Um, so um, I do think people should contact their legislators about this. Um, legislators are totally allowed to testify. And this is a statewide issue. Um, one of the legislators who has weighed in on this issue the last time around um, is the former uh, city manager for Augusta and now legislator for Augusta. His name is Bill Briggio, and he is passionate about fishing for brook trout and landlocked salmon in, in Mud Lake, Grass Pond, and Pleasant Lake. And so he is strongly opposed to this project and um, has written great letters to LUPC about it. I think um, folks should be perfectly comfortable reaching out to their own legislators wherever they are in the state and urging them to weigh in on this because the Katahdin region is special to people throughout Maine. And we need people throughout Maine to tell LUPC to protect it. Thanks, Nick. We've had a bunch of other questions about if this recording will be available and shareable, where people can get more information. Um, and so I will be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow that will include a bunch of additional background information. So links to our website, link to the LUPC, where you can see the proposal and submit comments, a link to this recording, um, some other fact sheets we have. So um, we'll get that out to you again tomorrow and there will definitely be more background info. And if anything's not covered, we're always happy to answer questions as well. So feel free to reach out to us that way. Um, let's see, we have a couple of technical questions coming in about mining that I think we'll write down and might get back to you indiv individually. Um, one of the questions we have here um, is a good one. It says, uh, what are the things that will most affect the LUPC decision? How important is public opinion or is it going to be more of a decision-making process? I don't think- or, sorry, should... technical decision-making process. I skipped that word. <laughs> Both of those things are important. And 
you know, I think that there's no question that we have to do well in the technical parts of the hearing. And we have a good team that's working on that. And I think we will do well, but there is no substitute for an overwhelming show of public opposition. And that will, without question, influence the LUPC. I think if, if main people show up to the hearing in the numbers that are reflective about, uh, reflective of how people, you know, feel about this proposal based on the number of opposition comments from the last time around, that it will be an overwhelming number of people who oppose the mine. But you have to show up. That's, that, that's a lot of the battle in all of these things. Um, we, we have a question about um, more people who are opposed to the mine. So folks asking, has Trout Unlimited offered any support or have any of the surrounding organized towns taken any action on the proposal? Do, do you want me to take that again, Kristen? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so Trout Unlimited actually doesn't have a main staff person right now, but their former staff person is a guy named Jeff Reardon. And he wrote a great letter um, about the problems that this mine would cause to the waters and the fisheries in the area. He now works for Atlantic Salmon Federation. Um, I suspect that he will write an equally great letter um, about the threat of this mine to Atlantic Salmon. Um, there are many volunteer members of Child Unlimited. And if you have connections to them, um, asking them to get the main council to weigh in against this would be super helpful. And any of the local chapters that want to weigh in against this would also be really helpful. And then any surrounding organized towns that have taken action on the proposal? So unfortunately, there are a few surrounding organized towns that have taken action in support of the proposal. And then there was a tie in Mount Chase. And so Mount Chase did not take action in support of the proposal. So it's sort of a mixed bag on that one. Great. Okay, well, we're pumping up, uh, coming up on eight o'clock. And I think that is most of our questions that have come in. Again, I see a few more technical questions and I, I've written them down. We'll reach out to you via email to follow up. Um, but I wanna take a moment to thank our speakers for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Nick. Um, and thank all of you for showing up on Zoom and hearing us out. Um, and I'm excited about these questions and interaction in the chat. Um, and again, we'll follow up via email and um, are, are glad to have you with us. Um, but I think that's all for me. Any last word from our speakers? Great. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.